Welcome. Baruch Ata Adonai Elohim, the Melech Olam, Asher Kitchana, the Mitzvah, the Tivanu, the Asok, the Divra Torah. Amen. We are this week, we're on Parshat Emor. Parshat Emor is um, significant, uh, especially for two major reasons. Uh, the first reason has to do with um, it discusses who, you know, rules concerning the priest. We're going to actually look at the rules concerning the high priest and the level of discipline and personal, personal control and discipline that they were going to have to observe and uh, issues involving what makes for a, an acceptable offering and the sensitivities involved in that. And then the second major part that makes Parshat Emor one of the most read Parshiot in the Torah is the fact that it goes through a calendar of the seven major festivals. And that's found here in Parshat Emor. So generally speaking, we read from this Parsha uh, almost on every single festival. So that's why it's, it's referenced quite a bit. And, with that, we'll go into Parshat Emor, and I'll make sure I have it. I'm going to have it on the screen. Yes, we should be able to show it. Here we are. So the, the, last, the last time we, I probably shouldn't even mention this, but I will regardless. Uh, the last time we had been discussing the issue of a priest's daughter that was engaged in uh, some kind of adultery and that, that there's a special level of, of um, insult and you know, responsibility involved. But we're gonna move on. Not to say that we'll never come back to it. Who knows, if we can keep this going for a while, my hope is that we can go deeper into these subjects. So, v'hakohen hagadol me'echav. And the priest who is elevated above his brothers, Asher Yutzak al Rosho, upon whom, uh, on, on whose head, Rosho, Shemet HaMishcha, the oil of anointing, Yutzak al Rosho, is uh, poured out on his head, in other words, who is anointed, Umile et Yado, and he was ordained, Literally, it means to fill his hands, to fill his hands. So give me one moment. Okay. Lil Bosch et Habagadim, to wear the clothes. So we know that um, the high priest uh, wore more clothing than the other priests. Et Rosho lo yifra. He shall not, now in one translation, it says he should not bear his head, but you'll see that Rashi goes in a whole different direction, just the different, opposite direction. Uvagadav lo yifrom. And he, nor should he rend his garments. We are talking about a case when he loses a member of his family. Uh, we'll, we'll clarify that, but that's essentially what we're talking about. In other words, the kinds of mourning customs that we have to indicate our state of mourning, a high priest is forbidden. This is part of his discipline. He is forbidden to participate in any of those kinds of practices uh, to show mourning. And uh, it certainly lends itself to thinking through some of the implications of that. So here we go. Lo yifra, Rashi, lo yifra. I just want to make sure I am reading this correctly. Uh, yeah. So in the in Sifra, lo yigadel pera. It means just the opposite. It means he shouldn't allow his locks to grow long because we actually do have a custom that when you're in mourning, uh, you're supposed to, especially for a parent where the period of time is longer, that in fact, you allow your hair to grow. Having a haircut, trimming your hair is considered to be a, a pleasure, physical and mental pleasure. 
And when you're in a state of mourning, you try to get away from those kinds of experiences. Al avail. So he should not, the whole sentence is, he should not allow his hair to grow for a, in, in a regard, if he's in mourning. The Ezehu says, Gidul Pera, and Rashi says, and how do you define allowing your hair to grow long in a halachic sense? Your Tera Mishlo Shimyum. It means going without a haircut for more than 30 days. That's what, that's what uh, an intentional act of allowing your hair to grow long entails. Keep going. So the Torah is going to clarify this particular sentence, and it says, for al kol nafshot mate lo yavo, and regarding any soul that is deceased, any deceased soul, lo yavo, he should not come. And now, since it's already said, this this, this is going to involve uh, an interesting an interesting. Um, uh, derivation here or analysis. It goes on to say, "La aviv imo lo yitama." He should not defile himself for his father or his mother. And of course, I'm sure you're already thinking, "Wait a second. If it said he's not allowed to come in contact with any deceased person, doesn't that include his mother and his father?" So in that case, why does the Torah add to his father and his mother? Why does it need to add that? And um, I'm going to go with the Rashi, and then we'll talk about a subject that's an interesting subject, concept in halacha, in Jewish law. For al kol nafshot mate, so he says, he's talking when it says regarding any soul of a deceased person, it refers to Be'ohel Hamet, regarding going into a covered area, right? Literally the tent of the deceased. He cannot enter that. This is a law that we actually read in the Parsha of Chukat in the book of Numbers uh, about the fact that the impurity involved in coming in contact with a body, with a corpse, is a very, very high level of impurity to the extent that one can contract it through just being in the same room, that is to say, under the same roof as that particular, as, as the corpse. That's a very unusually high um, possibility of, of contamination. So, enough short mate souls of the dead, and this is the tractate Nazir concerning Nazarites. So here we go. This is an interesting uh, exp explanation, right, or interpretation. Lahavi revi'it dam min hamet shemitame ba'oil. So what this comes to teach you, right, the fact that it talks about, it doesn't say mate, it says nafshot mate, okay? It says soul of the dead. So we are not talking, therefore, just simply about a body. It includes the Havi to include Rivi'it Dam, that is one fourth log, that's an amount of blood, min hame, from the deceased person, Shemitame Ba'oho, that even if the body isn't there, but if there's a pool of blood, uh, the, uh, the, at least the amount of one fourth of a log, if it's less than a fourth of a log, then it doesn't do this, doesn't apply. But if it's at least a fourth of a log and it's just the blood and it's in a tent and a priest goes into that tent, the priest is now contracts the particular type of tumah that, that it could, even if there were a corpse there. So just because there isn't one doesn't mean one isn't capable of that particular uh, contamination. And I'm sorry to use those kind of words because they're connotations involved, but it just means, you know, that you're catching it. So uh, that's, that's the fact that it says enough short mate.
doesn't just say mate. If it had just said mate, then it would have to be the body itself. But now it's talking about, in other words, we know it says, we read it, dam hu ha nefesh, that the blood is the nefesh of the person. So this is how you're getting this very rigorous interpretation here. Now we go on to la aviv ulimo lo yitama. So this is this dealing now with that apparent, um, the redundancy of mother, father, and mother. Why is it in here? And again, this is in uh, tractate uh, Nazir. I believe this refers to um, page 48, I'm going to guess, or the Torah Kohanim, and we now know we're studying the book of Leviticus, and we know that the Torah Kohanim is the Sifra, it's this major, major halachic analysis, and halachic midrash on Leviticus. So, lo ba ela, so the only reason why the father and the mother are mentioned here Lahatir lo meit mitzvah is to say that a high priest is permitted, the hatir, he's permitted to contaminate himself, to become tame for the sake of a meit mitzvah. What is a meit mitzvah? So, meit mitzvah literally means, of course, a deceased person that is a commandment, right? Mitzvah. The story is this that if you come upon a body and you, there are, there's no one taking care of that corpse, you have to take care of that corpse. And what this is saying is that the way this works is that the Midrash goes this way. Yes, he's not supposed to defile himself for a corpse. But since the Torah says specifically for his father, so we fought, say, well, for his father, he's not supposed to uh, become a tame, but for a mate mitzvah, he becomes tame. And then when it says ule imo, it goes on to sort of suggest if he's going on to perform the, uh, the rite for Yom Kippur, and he's on his way to do that, he shouldn't do it. He, he, I'm sorry. He would normally not, but for the sake of a mate mitzvah, he has to do it. So this is how there's, there's, of course, a much more detailed interpretation that goes into how this works. But I just wanted to let you know, basically, how this, how they interpret these additional words here. So a, a high priest, right, who may be a Nazir, who may be a Nazarite, who has to, uh, who is on his way to, to do the right for Yom Kippur. If he comes upon a mate mitzvah, he still has to take care of it. He has to defile himself for the sake of the mate mitzvah. So it's, there's, again, this is a lot that one can contemplate in terms of how important it is for not, not to desecrate a body and to have respect for the actual physical body of an individual uh, to such a degree. It just puts it very, very clearly. Um, and uh, it's very interesting, I think, something to think about in terms of a value of how a person's body is something that should be treated with respect. We have, we know about the Hevra Kadisha and how when a person dies, how the body is washed and prepared for burial and treated with great respect. Uh, and I think there are some very, very deep spiritual and psychological issues that are going on with that particular, that particular dynamic of this holiday, this uh, halacha. Um, but this um, is, go ahead. Question. I think he also might be the one who might find his parents because of the close relationship that he has to be very careful not to walk in on his on a on a dead parent right that would be the yeah. shot of it right i would or think so say, or, to, uh, or, or one might right. have said yes one might have said well the reason why it mentions father and mother is because you could think of them as being the exceptional case that is but that is not the way the halacha treats it mm -hmm. The halacha wants us to understand that this whole concept of how you treat someone, and essentially a mate mitzvah is a situation where there's no one else around to take care of a body. 
if they're relatives, if they're friends, if there's anyone else, then the person is no longer considered a make mitzvah. So usually the way it's cast is that you're walking along the road, you're in the middle of nowhere, and you come across a corpse. And there's no reason to think that anyone else is taking care of this body. And just how, how you respect it. And, and this also says how we need to respect our own bodies. I think there's some implications about that regarding how we take care of our bodies. And this, this actually raises a, an interesting question, which I like to ask, which is who owns your body? Do you own your body? And if you claim you own your body, on what basis? On what basis do you say you own your body? Did you give birth to yourself? Do your parents own your body? And the idea that your body is actually owned by the one who ultimately created you. And to have that consciousness and to recognize that since your body is not yours, you don't have ownership over your body. You have a responsibility to take care of it. That this is something that is given you on loan, that essentially you're loaned your body which means you have responsibilities regarding your body. And what got me thinking about this uh, quite seriously was that some years ago, there was a traveling exhibit that I think came out of China, if I'm not mistaken. Some of you may remember, it was actually on exhibit in St. Louis at the time, where they had, apparently they had convicts, uh, real people, whose bodies were donated or something, or simply because they were convicts, their bodies were simply appropriated. And this person would cut away the bodies, you know, basically find a way to preserve these living bodies, put them in positions, and you'd see their muscles, they were cut away, or their skeletons possibly, I don't know. I never went to the exhibit uh, for an obvious reason, is that I felt it was a desecration. But again, it goes down to who, you know, who owns your body? And if you don't own your body, what rights do you have as opposed to if you think you own your body? But then that begs that question, on what basis do you have? So I guess you were saying that even, and these people had not given permission as far as I know in this right. exhibit, Correct. but right. even had they, you would have said it was a de desecration. And Correct. that has to do with, I guess, why Jews are buried without being treated or cremated or whatever. Right, right. It, it certainly underlies it, Lauren. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Uh, it wasn't up to them to give permission. So there are limits, right? Obviously, when you rent something or when you loan something, it gives you certain rights over it. But it doesn't give you total rights over it. And essentially, it means you have to take care of it. You have to use it for the purpose for which you loaned it and, 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 and take responsibility. So, I mean, I think it's such an interesting concept. I don't think a lot of people actually ever think about it. I think we just assume we own our bodies. And in some ways I think, and of course you're, you're most welcome to disagree with me, but I think it's a very sophisticated concept. And I think it has very good, very really profound and really good um, implications if we look at our bodies in that particular way. Uh, should I go on or does anybody want to make a point? Okay, I'll go on. We can come back to it if you want. Keep it going. We'll keep going on this particular subject. Umin hamikdash. This is so interesting, right? Umin hamikdash. Lo yetze. He should not go out of the sanctuary. But lo yichalel et mikdash elohav. So that he not profane the sanctuary of his God. Why? Ki nezer shemen mishcha elohav alav for the um, the wreath you might call this of the in other words it's like a crown right like a crown of the oil of anointing of his God is upon him and then it ends with ani Hashem I am the Lord so so he's not even allowed to go out of the sanctuary of that area. And I believe, because this is in Sanhedrin, where I read about this, that I recollect many years ago, is that in a case where a high priest um, lost a relative 
for whom one is normally obligated to mourn, right? So in other words, mother, father, spouse, brother, sister, child. Those are all close relatives for whom you're obligated to mourn. That what would happen is in terms of the procession of taking the buyer uh, to the grave, to the cemetery, uh, they would have the procession. And the high priest, I believe, would actually not be in the same street as they were. And the way he would follow, although this seems to contradict what we're, what we're reading, at least the shot of what we're reading, is he would wait for them essentially to turn the corner. But we also know that there are observant Jews who are Kohanim, who, who would claim descendancy from the priestly line, who will not who observe these laws of not going into a cemetery or not going into a hospital or a, uh, or a uh, funeral home or stuff, a stand outside when this is going on. And I actually remember a rabbi, uh, this, he was a conservative rabbi back then in Cincinnati, who was a Kohen, and when he'd do a funeral, they had an arrangement where he would stand outside the room where the funeral was taking place. Uh, there was a window there so people could see him, but he'd perform the funeral in that particular way. And I imagine that's what they even do today. Let me go on. Here we, so here we go. This is what he's going to say. Lo yitzay, he shall not go out. Just to make sure I've, okay. Umin hamikdash. So let's start off. Umin hamikdash, lo yitzay. He should not go out of the sanctuary. And here we go. He's quoting Torah Kohanim and the tractate Nazir. Eno holech achar amita. He does not follow the buyer. For od mikan lamdu rabotenu. And from, from this, our sages learned Shekohen Gadol, okay, this is really interesting, that a Kohen Gadol, that a high priest, Makriv Onain, okay, that even if, so an Onain, this is a state that you're in, when you have lost this one of your immediate relatives, and they are still to be buried, they are not, they haven't been buried yet, and that period of time between the death and the burial, is called Aninut. Now, there is another definition that's similar to that, but isn't quite the same. And please forgive me, I do not remember exactly how that is, how that's understood. What I'm giving you is the current of the definition of in halacha as how we understand Aninut. And that is this period of time between the death and the burial. So, what this is saying is that even though the Kohen Gadol is in a state of Aninut, his relative has not been buried yet, he still is able to perform a sacrifice. He is able to do that. Now, normally, and nowadays, this is how this applies, that when you're in a state of Aninut, you're, um, you're absolved of positive mitzvot. So, for example, a positive mitzvah would be going to pray in a minyan. So prior to the burial, you are absolved from that. You are not, you are not supposed to go do that. And the fact is that if you, in fact, go to a minyan at that point, you don't count in the minyan because you're not obligated. You're free from that obligation. And there are many other positive mitzvot that in this period of time, you are uh, not obligated to perform. However, a high, so normally you'd say that a high priest, if he was in a state of Aninud, wouldn't be able to perform a sacrifice. But we learn that he does, because it says he should not go out of the mikdash, of the sanctuary. V'chein mashma'o, right? And so the implication is, af im metu aviv ve'imo, even if his father and mother passed away, a not sarich let seit min hamikdash. So here we go. He does. So the way they understand this is interesting. It's not as a a. It says a not sarich means he is not obligated let seit min hamikdash to go out of the sanctuary. Ella oved avoda, but he can go ahead and perform his service. So as I said, because it says it understands this particular statement is saying that if he doesn't want to, 
He doesn't have to, but if he does choose to go and follow the buyer to the cemetery, he does this in this particular way where he's never in the same street as the funeral procession. He should not profane the sanctuary. Here we go. So what it says is, so what it's saying is that it's, this is understood as that he does not defile, he does not profane in this way, the, the service that he's performing. That is, of course, the, the sacrifice that he's making. So it's seen as a statement of fact, right, or of law, that in this way he does not profane the sacrifice he's performing. Because scripture has given him permission. So from this we can infer that if a Kohen Hediot means a non-high priest, a regular priest, if a regular priest, Sha'avad or Nain, that if he, in fact, if this regular priest performed a sacrifice in a state of Aninut, Chalal, he has profaned, he has profaned the sanctuary. So because we have this principle that from a negative statement, we infer a positive statement, and from a positive statement, we infer a negative statement. So the positive statement is that if a Kohen Gadol does and performs the sacrifice, it does not profane the sacrifice. So what's the negative that if a regular priest does? does. Yes, question? Yes. Um, so is that, is the rabbi of whom you spoke, assuming that he was the high priest? No, 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 not at all. No, just a that's that's correct. Which is, and of course, he was no nobody's performing sacrifices nowadays anyway, right? He was simply performing a funeral. That's not the same thing, uh, if I'm understanding you correctly. But um, yeah, so that's why he would not go into the room. He would not go into the room out of because even a regular priest, remember, even a regular priest is only allowed to defile himself for his immediate relatives. The earlier part of this parsha, we have not started at the beginning of the parsha. At the beginning of the parsha, it talks about a regular priest. And this is, this is introducing the, the exceptional situation of a high priest. Rabbi? Yes. I got a question. <clears throat> all the rabbis are like us. We're, we're all the same. Uh, a rabbi is not a priest, but no. he's a learned person, and we, we follow him on his learned per, per, uh, you know, ways. Yeah. But, uh, but the Kohanes today, uh, they've got to be very careful about going to the cemetery and doing all these things, because <clears throat> they can do it for their uh, mother and their father. They can defile themselves for their mother and father, for their uh, sister that's not married, for a brother, and so on and so on. But uh, otherwise, for a regular person, no. They have to stand outside the cemetery. Even if they want to perform the service, they have to stand outside and perform it. Is that correct? If they wish to follow Jewish law, yes. Okay. Now, I, I haven't read this. Of course, any of these subjects have a lot of information. The, the practical element of this is no longer in force. And the practical element of this has to do with offer, offering sacrifices. Mm -hmm. We don't offer sacrifices anymore. Okay, we're not in a position, not that we don't want to, we wish we could. I mean, I know a lot of people obviously don't feel that way, but at least if you're, if you're in a place where you say, look, this is something God commanded, and if God commanded it, this is what the Torah tells us, and we believe that the Torah has in it divine commandments, then, you know, this, and there's so much stuff in the prayer books, in the traditional prayer books about the desire to see the temple rebuilt. Okay, we're supposed to end every silent Amida with this prayer that may the temple be rebuilt. Okay, so, but the point is it isn't. Right now it isn't. And then no sacrifices permissible. You're not per permitted to offer a sacrifice to perform any kind of animal sacrifice because the temple isn't in existence. So the, the practical ramification of becoming impure was, was that you couldn't go into the temple and you couldn't perform any sacrifices. 
Well, that's no longer current. So there are many, many, most, most Kohanim these days don't observe this particular law for pragmatic reasons, okay? Well, what but, the, uh, Kohen but there are some who do. There's some who choose to try to be respectful of this. I got another question. What if the Kohen are, uh, 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 say they are imperfect, they, uh, they have a boil or they have uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so far so on. Uh, right. Could they still perform? Well, we read we read about this last year, okay? And we read how they could partake of the sacrifices that went to the coin the parts, but they couldn't go up on the on the altar itself. They couldn't do that. All right. If they had certain types of physical uh pro, you know, physical <clears throat> distortions, they could not perform up there. We read this last year. We discussed this last year. And again, these are not easy things in our own for the kind of sensitivities we have necessarily to understand these things. But in, in a lot of it has to do with um, deep respect, trying to show deep respect. And, and I think it was very significant that even if this person had this particular bodily defect, they certainly could... They, they had all the perks, even if they couldn't go up there. You know, it, is, it is still part of the world you know, that we live in. You know, that if, a, uh, I got a question. Could a, uh, a daughter of a, a Kohen who marries a commoner, could mm -hmm. she still perform a Kohen uh, a practice? What you're saying is, could she still get the benefits as she was in her father's house? And the answer is Correct. no. I mean, again, it doesn't apply necessarily. I don't know how it would necessarily apply nowadays, but no. On the other hand, if, if, if she was childless, if she, wasn't, if she did not have any children and the marriage terminated and she went back to her father's house, then she would still have the, the particular you know, benefits of being a daughter of a priest. But if she, she married a, yeah. Go ahead. She would still be. Um, uh, um, uh, she, she would still get an aliyah of as a kohen. Uh, oh, first. Okay. So, so Harlan, an aliyah is a sort of a modern practice. So we we really couldn't count that. So it's it's not a question that you know it's a good question, but we'd have to you know you have to go sort through a whole bunch of other kinds of issues. But they would be. You're right in the sense that they would be probably linked. You know that there's some linkage between those things, so it's it's more com it's more complicated than I really can deal with here. I'm going to stop the recording.